1 Corinthians and chapter 8. Paul writes, Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. But if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. All right, let's stop there for now. So moving on now in our study on 1 Corinthians. Here in chapter 8, Paul is continuing to address some things that the Corinthian church had written to him about. And he talked about marriage in the last chapter, some questions they had about that. Now they've asked him concerning, again in verse 1, uh, touching things offered unto idols. And so now through chapters 8, 9, and 10 here in 1 Corinthians, Paul is going to deal with this issue. And the, the situation here is not really so much specifically for, for our purposes and for the church as a whole talking about just meat offered to idols. Because you and I today, we, uh, we don't really have that problem. Too much. I mean, we don't really we don't live. Although you you might not know it anymore, but we don't live in a pagan uh, society where where this kind of thing is an issue. Now, there are plenty of idols temples out there, and and we all know that. And uh, and so those those issues of of religion do exist. But what Paul is the larger issue that Paul's going to be talking about here through these three chapters is what we call doubtful things. Things that God doesn't command one way or the other. He doesn't say this is a sin or this is something good to do. It's something that's either not addressed or that God specifically says, uh, frankly, you can do this or you can do that. It's in those places, you know, the places that God makes a definite statement about, this is a sin, don't do that. Well, we all pretty much agree. That's a sin. That's not a good thing to do. It's in these gray areas, these doubtful places, that a lot of the contention uh, comes in, into the body of Christ. And people see these things uh, differently. And then what that does is it causes us to impose our own ideas and opinions onto one another so that we end up judging one another for doing something that I might not do but that God never says don't do it or, or do it. It's just something that's a personal conviction of mine and I see someone else doing it and I say, well, you know, that, that a Christian shouldn't do that. No, I shouldn't do that. But for me to say a Christian shouldn't do, do that is a whole other issue. So this is what Paul's going to be dealing with now in these next three chapters. So he says, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. So we've all, we've all got knowledge. We know that. We all, he's talking to saved people here. Look, if you're saved... You've got, you've got knowledge. You've got some very special knowledge. You understand what a rare breed you are if you're a saved person and how few people, relatively speaking, know what you know. So just by being saved, we have a wisdom and a knowledge that, uh, that the world doesn't have. Paul spent the first couple of chapters of this book talking about that. Staying away from that worldly wisdom and getting the wisdom of God. So we've all got knowledge. We know that. 
he's, and he's, the idea there is we're going to fight about our knowledge. Here's what I know. Oh yeah, well here's what I know. Uh, and and so he, he sets that out up front. He says, look, we know. We all have knowledge, okay? Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. So now here's going to be the issue as, as we move forward here. Are we going to be puffed up or are we going to be edified? Are we going to be built up? Are we going to be walking in pride, the pride of my own knowledge? Or am I going to be walking in the charity of looking around at the, at the assembly, at the brethren, at the body of Christ... And, and thinking, how can I behave and, and act and conduct myself in a way that's for their good? Am I going to puff myself up or am I going to build them up? Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. You and I, especially us, right dividers, dispensational folk, we make a big deal out of knowledge, out of doctrine, and we should. Doctrine is everything that we that we do. The way we live this Christian life is by understanding doctrine. But then that doctrine, that's not where it stops. See, if you if you cut it off here at the neck, and all you've got is knowledge in your head, then that knowledge is going to puff you up. The idea is to get that doctrine down into your soul to where it is actually working and producing and living in your life. So knowledge puffs up, but charity edifieth. And that's the difference between those two things. What is that knowledge? He's not saying don't have knowledge. He's saying what is that knowledge doing for you? If any man think, and so now he's going to take us down a few pegs here in verse 2, if any man think that he he knoweth anything, so that's that's for all of us smart people, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. So you and I, everything that we know now going beyond, I mean, you know, being a Christian, that in and of itself, I know that Jesus Christ died for my sins, and you out there, you don't. Well, I only know what I ought to know because them out there, they ought to know it too. But I don't know anything, uh, I don't know anything special beyond what God has given me to know. Now take that further. For you and for me, we know a lot of stuff that other people that know that Jesus Christ died for their sins don't know. Paul says, if you know anything, You don't know anything but what you ought to know. And I don't know everything that I ought to know. So the more I know and the more I learn, I'm only growing in what I ought to know anyway. So that's what Paul is is giving us here as 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 a baseline. Everything we know is nothing, nothing, uh, no credit to us. And We've got a long way to go yet in our knowledge. So getting that, understanding that, he says, but, so that's about what you know, that's cutting it off at the neck, that's what's in your head. But, if any man love God, the same is known of him. So now here's what we're coming to. What is that knowledge doing for you? Paul is about to go into all of these chapters talking about loving the brethren and thinking about the brethren. But it starts here. If any man love God, then the same is known of him. Now what he's talking about, he's talking about God. Paul tells the Galatians, he says, after you have known God, or rather are known of God, then how can you, and the the issue is the same, how are you going to turn back to these idols? You're known of God. But Paul says, if you go beyond that, your own head knowledge, and you let that head knowledge work in you a love of God, God takes notice of that. The same is known of Him. God takes notice of it, and the people that you come in contact will take notice of it too. So, that knowledge that you and I have in the Word, is meant to do something. And if it's not doing what it's designed to do, 
It's actually a negative in your in your life. It's only puffing you up. It's making you you were, you'd be better off not having it than to have it and to not have it working as it ought. So if any man love God, the same is known of him. And where does our love for the brethren come from? It comes from that. It comes from our love of, of God, for God. As concerning therefore, so that's our verse, those three verses, is, is, is the foundation and the base that Paul is laying here to answer the actual question. As concerning therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For we, let's read the next couple of verses, get them all in a a row here. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So Paul says, we know that we all have knowledge. And here's the knowledge that we have. We know that an idol is nothing. That these stocks of wood and of stone that these heathen out here are sacrificing to and worshiping, that those things are they are just that. They're, they're stocks of, of wood and stone. The psalmist says they have eyes and they don't see, they have ears and they don't hear, they have mouths but they can't speak. They're just dumb idols. We know that. We know that these are not, uh, you know, you're praying to that statue isn't, isn't, isn't doing anything for you. We understand all of that. Now, beyond that, because we know all of that, right? But there are a lot of things in this Christian life still today that fall under this same category. So let's see how many we can list here. Uh, The big three, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, and what are we going to put in the three spot? Gambling. Let's do that. Beyond that, um, going to the movies, dancing. Listening to secular music, I'm sure they're all coming into your head now faster than I'm than I'm saying them, right? Uh, women wearing pants, women wearing pants in church, men wearing long hair, tattoos. Um, what else? I'm sure you can think of many other things that. Someone getting up behind the pulpit without a tie on. Uh, all, all of that, that kind of thing. So we have all of, these, all of these issues still. And so what Paul is going to be dealing with here is not so much are those things right or wrong. The issue is what do we do with the fact that so many of us see these things differently? See, now that list that I just went through there, if you have one of those things in your life that you think, well, that's perfectly fine. Who's got a problem with that? I don't have a problem with that. But then there's another one of those things that I just listed that you think, oh, well, yeah, no, obviously Christians ought not do that. This passage is talking to you. Okay? And we've all got some of that, don't we? So this is uh, certainly not an irrelevant passage of Scripture for us just because it's talking about idols. So again, in verse 4, As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. So we know that. We know that there is one God and that those idols are nothing. For though there be, there are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God. 
So Paul, here he's saying what he's doing is he's calling us, he's calling us into a unity of mind here. What he's doing is he's saying we all have this knowledge. We all know that there's only one God and that all these idols are nothing. But he's, he's taking that knowledge now that we have and he's calling us to use it to unity. Because he says there's, there's none other God but one. And then he says, look, there are other gods. There's all these other gods in heaven and in earth. There be gods many and lords many. But to us, there's only one God. So what is Paul doing here? He's taken that knowledge that we all have and that we all share, and he's bringing it into that, into that practical uh understanding that actually begins to unify us to bring us together rather than causing us to fight and argue and and to what he calls doubtful disputations there are gods there are those that are called gods whether in heaven or in earth so there are gods in heaven we all know who the, who they are right the angels are called gods throughout the bible And there are gods in heaven. He says there are gods on the earth. Here, we haven't looked at a passage yet. Come back with me to Exodus chapter 22. There are gods many. You remember uh, what Satan told Eve in the garden? Eat from this tree and you shall be as gods. Right? That's what that's what they wanted. That's what she wanted. She wanted to be like the gods. In Exodus in chapter 22, but then Paul says there are gods in heaven, but there are gods on earth. Exodus chapter 22, one verse, verse 28. Exodus 22, 28. Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. So, governmental rulers in the Bible are called gods. The Lord makes a point when the psalmist called all the children of Israel gods, because the word of God came to them. And the Lord says if he called them gods, to whom the word came, here, essentially, here I am, the Word itself standing in front of you. Who do you think I am? Is basically what he was what he was doing. Man. But so there are gods many and lords many, and there are uh, these folks here. You're not supposed to curse uh, the ruler of thy people. But at the same time, we know that throughout time in this world, kings and Emperors and so forth have been worshipped as as divine, right? So you take a, a, a an authority figure like that, and you and you make a god out of him. Paul says in in Romans chapter one that they turn nature itself into into a god. They worship the sun and the moon and the stars and trees and and all kind of things that people make into gods. Here, come back. We're in Exodus 22. Come back to chapter 20. Now, Paul's point, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about how there's only one God here today because we all have that knowledge already. And that's Paul's point in, in his passage. He's not trying to convince them that there's only one God. He's saying you already know this. Exodus chapter 20, we have the Ten Commandments. You should know that, by the way. At least know where the Tenth Commandments are. Exodus chapter 20. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So that's it. That's the first one, right? Right at the top of the list. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, you know... That verse is often misunderstood uh, as the next couple of verses, these first four verses that that talk about man's relation relation to God. 
thou shalt have no other gods before me, we take that oftentimes to, to mean that you shouldn't put any other gods uh, or anything ahead of God, before God. But that's not, no, that's true, but that's not what this commandment is saying. Look, look down further in the, in the chapter in verse 23. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. See, that's the idea of having no other gods before God. It doesn't mean ahead of Him. It means you're standing before God. You're worshiping, you're living, you're praying. You are God's people. And you don't live before me worshiping other other gods. It's the same idea of Paul talking about... Um, being blessed with all spiritual blessings and uh, standing before God in love in Ephesians chapter 1 there, in front of God. So he says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So they could say, well, okay, no other gods before him. So he has to be number one. But as long as he's number one, then we can have all these other, all these other gods as long as they come after him. No, that's not the idea. The idea is no other gods before God, and since God is everywhere, you're always before God. People do, well, we're getting off now, taking the name of the Lord in vain. All of those things have to do with that. We, we do, we do uh, something similar with that. We make it mean don't say God's name in vain. Well, you ought not. I think that it's disrespectful to... to you don't say, oh my God, uh, or yell out the name Jesus Christ for just because something shocking happened or, or whatever it is. But that's not what he's saying. He said, don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. He's talking about an oath. You don't swear by God and then not fulfill the oath. That's what that's talking about. And that's people do that all the time. So that's a much that's the offense. Is, is that. So, anyway, this idea of there are gods many and lords many, but to us there's one God. That's not a new revelation. We all know that. It goes all the way back to the beginning, back in our passage. And the idol is nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So there's gods in heaven, there's gods on earth, God's many and Lord's many. Verse 6, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. So we have one God and one Lord, and all things are of the Father, and all things are by Jesus Christ. We all know how that operates, right? Everything originates in God the Father, and then when He does something, when He works, He works through, He works by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what He did in the creation. Everything that was made, John says, by Him, by Jesus Christ, were all things created. Everything that's made, without Him was not anything made that was made. All things are by Him. All things are of the Father, and we are in the Father, and we are by Jesus Christ. Now again, hold here, come with me to Ephesians in chapter 4. Because Paul is going beyond that knowledge here that we all have. Ephesians chapter 4. He's trying to get that knowledge to, to draw us together. You know, it occurs to me as I'm going through this book of 1 Corinthians and studying it to teach, uh, which is a whole other thing. If you've ever taught the Word of God, you know that your own personal study is one thing. But if you know that you're going to have to explain it in some kind of a hopefully understandable way, that's a whole other thing. What Paul is doing here is he's bringing these Corinthians, these Corinthians that we think of as being kind of a base people, young babes in Christ. They, they have all these flesh issues and all of these kind of 
problems that you and I generally, uh, you know, after you've been in the Lord for a year or two or whatever, you pretty much got all that stuff behind you. And we think of these Corinthians as that. But it's only, it's, it's primarily those first few chapters before he starts at actually answering their questions that he has to deal with that kind of base fornication and, and those kind of, kind of issues. Now he's writing to people who, are, who were actually interested enough and invested enough and cared enough to inquire further. So now he's starting off at that baseline and saying, okay, we all got this already. Now let me take you, take you higher. And, and that's what the Bible does. That's what God does. It's what the Lord did. You remember when he's, he's, he's given the whole multitude those parables. They're all out there. They all came out to hear him. And he's speaking to them in parables. Nobody knows what he's talking about. And they all go away, not knowing what they just heard. Except this small group, the twelve and others, who cared enough to stick around and to ask, to inquire, Lord, what did you mean by that? And it's to them that he gives the truth of those parables. And he says to those other folks, it's not given to them. It's given to you. To who? To, to those of us who care enough to invest the time and the energy and the love toward the truth of, of God's Word. That's where you get, you know, we all love knowledge. But if you really want that higher and deeper truth, it's going to come out of the knowledge that you have. And you're going to understand some actual deeper applications to that knowledge that you've got in your head. That's that higher thing you're looking for. Here in Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So Paul spends the first three chapters of Ephesians talking essentially about that vocation wherewith they they are called, and he says, therefore... The reason I told you all that, gave you all that knowledge, was so that you could walk worthy of it. With all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. That's what he's going to be telling these Corinthians about. Weaker and stronger brethren, bearing one another, forbearing one another. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. So here again, just like in our passage, he's talking about one God and one Lord. And we we take this passage oftentimes and we say, okay, here is the sevenfold uh, unity of the Spirit, and it is, that's exactly what it is, but... We use it then to say, here's the criteria that you have to meet in order to fellowship with us. And in, in a very real sense, it is that, but that's not why Paul's bringing it out here. He's not saying these things to tell us who to exclude. He's, he's telling us about one God and one Lord, all this knowledge that we have already, to say, look, these are the things that bind you. It's not about who do we keep out. It's about how do we build the unity of those with whom we do fellowship. See, we like to contend. Charity, love, forbearance, those things aren't so easy. It's much easier to fight, to disagree, to argue. Back in our passage... I only have so much time. First Corinthians chapter eight. I I I need to be very conscious to stay off my uh, soapbox because this is a pet peeve of mine, and I'm and I'm trying not to get in the way of the passage here. First Corinthians chapter eight, verse seven. 
So there's one God, one Lord. Howbeit, there is not in every man that knowledge. Oh wait, no, everybody doesn't know that there's only one God and one Lord. For some, with conscience of the idol, unto this hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. So now you've got these idol-worshiping Gentiles who got saved and, and joined the church here at Corinth, and you've got people at different levels of, of growth and of maturity, and there are still people, and you and I probably understand, if you came out of any other, any religion, you understand that the, that the, uh, the, the effects of that linger. It takes a long time to kind of purge, to let the doctrine purge that old stuff uh, out of you. So here are these guys, they're looking at this meat offered to idols as if it, idols are actually something to be, uh, to be uh, you know, feared and, and regarded and, and that kind of thing. So they've got, when he says in every man there is not that knowledge, he's not saying they don't know that there's one God and, and one Lord. He's saying that that knowledge hasn't, hasn't gotten down sunk in yet. So they see it as a thing offered to an idol in the last clause there. Their conscience being weak is defiled. So now we're talking about a person's conscience being defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. So let's take that. Even that, we don't have to leave meat, really, because even that, some uh, some folks will give you will give you trouble with. Um, as Christians, generally, we don't have a problem with pork and those kinds of things. But um, well, for one, there are some Christians, and more and more growing as this kind of natural health healing movement grows, tell you that you ought not eat meat at all. And in fact, they're starting to say it's a sin because of what it does to your to your body. Let me give you one thought on that. Okay. What they say is, and I'll tell you this because it's, it's in the air, what they say is that when the Bible was written, it was okay because we weren't pumping all kinds of garbage into these animals and, uh, and making them you know, dangerous. Now that sounds like okay. That, that kind of makes sense. My thinking on that is that Paul talking about the last days of the body of Christ, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times they are going to be speaking doctrines of devils, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received. So it's not just in Bible days, it's in the last days. Meat is okay to eat. Commercial. Um... But, but meat, verse 8, meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. So God is okay either way. Now, you want to be a vegetarian? You're not sinning. You want to abstain from certain kinds of meats? Maybe you don't like certain kinds of meats. It doesn't matter one way or the other to God. But here's the question of the passage. Does it matter to you? What you take in like that or what somebody else does? I know brethren who, who hold to because it's, it's before the law, we ought not eat blood. Now what that means is you eat a rare or medium rare steak and you're sinning against God. And uh, so, you know, like I said, we don't really have to have to leave meats to, to get away from this issue that we're talking about. But then there is all of those other things. All of those other things that the Bible doesn't speak to, saying this is a sin, put that in, in that verse. You do it, you don't do it, to God, it's all one and the same. So that's for your own conscience. 
but primarily in this passage, it's for how you, it's your attitude toward your brother and sister. Meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed. Okay, so now here's something that we need to take heed to. Lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So now here becomes the issue. Because we've all got knowledge. And when knowledge puffs up, knowledge likes to flaunt itself. That's what knowledge likes to do. Knowledge, when it gets puffed up, it likes to show itself. I want everyone to know how much I know. And when it comes to this issue of my liberty, of your liberty, and another brother who doesn't understand that they have that liberty, a puffed up knowledge wants to, wants to take that truth and just jam it down that, that other brother's throat like a ham sandwich. And Paul is saying, here's where the problem comes in now. See, you've got knowledge, but you don't have enough. Because you don't have the knowledge to understand that your knowledge needs to affect your attitude toward your brethren. And this, you see what he calls it in verse 9? The Apostle Paul calls this liberty, this liberty of yours. You know, that reminds me of the Lord over and over again talking to those Pharisees. He says, in your law, it says this. And in your law, it says, he's talking about the law. And he quotes the law. But he calls it your law. Paul is a preacher of grace and of liberty. But in this instance, he says, this liberty of yours. It's, it's almost spoken with disdain. Because they're using it improperly just like those Pharisees use the law this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak for if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols so that's pretty self-explanatory here's a guy he knows what he knows and he knows that he has liberty to eat meat and he has liberty to eat meat offered to idols. Apparently all the best meat was, was, uh, was brought to the temple and the priests took whatever their portion of it was and then the remainder of that was sold either in the open marketplace or that right there in the idols, in the idols temple. They had a, they had a butcher's store, butcher shop right there. So if you wanted a good cut of meat, what are you going to do? You're going to go and you're going to get that best cut of meat. So here's a brother who knows. I'm just I'm just going to the butcher shop as far as as far as he's concerned. He's going to go and get himself a cut of meat. But he's got this other brother over here who doesn't have that understanding in him yet, and he sees that. And this is an older, more mature person in the Lord. He sees that person going in and doing that thing, buying meat, going to the movies, you know, down smoking, drinking, gambling, you know, all those horrible things. And says, oh, that's okay to do. Well, it may be okay for that brother to go walk into that idol's temple and to, and to take that meat. And he walks out thinking nothing of it, didn't do a thing to him one way or the other. God didn't care. But this other brother now, who's going to be emboldened to go and do the same thing, but in his conscience it's not okay. So who is he taking now? Who is this weaker brother taking his example for what's okay and what's not okay? He's not taking the word of God. He's taking it from this other, from this other Christian. More mature, admittedly, but you and I, we, we, number one, we ought not do that. Right? I have seen, and you have seen, uh, pillars of the faith fall. And then crowds fall with them. 
Why? Because they were putting their they're they're clinging their their hopes and their and their faith in that man. You don't want to do that. But we're talking about a weaker brother here. So that's what weaker brethren tend to do. They look up to the person who's supposed to be an example and they're following that until that person can kind of hand them off to the Lord and say, here, you and God, you work this out between yourself now. So Paul is telling the stronger brother, be aware, be aware of your of your place in this body. And not not everyone knows what you know. If any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him that is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And watch through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? See now I'm I got this knowledge and I'm I'm somebody now. This knowledge is the you know get wisdom. Knowledge is the principal thing. Get wisdom with all I get and get understanding. You know, get knowledge. So I got knowledge. That's the most important thing. Well, now through my knowledge, my big wonderful head full of knowledge, this brother now is going to perish through my knowledge. Is that what that knowledge is there for? What, what good is that knowledge doing? Like I said to you, it's not only not doing any good, it's damaging. It's detrimental now to have knowledge and to not know what to do with it. Shall the weak brother perish through thy knowledge for whom Christ died? But when you sin so against the brethren, so the weaker brother is going to perish through my knowledge, and I'm sinning against the brethren. So I'm not sinning by eating the meat. I know that. I can do this thing. Eating the meat, substitute whatever you want to substitute. I can do this. But if the weaker brother is perishing through me knowing that I can do that, I'm not sinning by doing it. I'm sinning because I haven't shown charity to my weaker brother. And that thing does become a sin now to me. Not because God cares whether I do it one way or the other, but because there's an issue. You remember the Lord told those Pharisees, again, I'll keep coming back to that, because that's what we're talking about here is grace Pharisees. We're talking about people who insist that they know what they know, and people who don't know what they know are somehow less than them, and they just need to to grow up, put your big boy pants on, and quit crying about what I'm doing. Well, Paul says, no, that's not that's not how we treat one another. Those Pharisees, the Lord said, you 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 tithe of mint and cumin, the the smallest thing. If you find a penny on the street, you're going to give a tenth. You're going to break a tenth off and put that in the. You strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. You've, you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. And you're getting caught up in all of this minutia. And you're allowing it to cause you to sin. So much so that while the Lord is in that, in Pilate's house there, getting tried because they put him there. They're getting ready to crucify him, but they wouldn't walk into that place because they didn't want to be defiled by stepping into that building. Getting ready to crucify the Son of God. That's the kind of thing we're dealing with here. That's being a grace Pharisee. Shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Through your knowledge, but when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. So you're not just sinning against that brother. You're sinning against Christ, because where is that brother? That brother is in Christ. Wherefore, if meat make thy brother to offend, make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So Paul, you know, it is a faithful 
saying and word that's not scripture, but is a faithful saying. That you don't have... See, Paul, he says, if, if meat makes my brother to offend, then as long as the world exists, I will not eat meat. Now look, Paul was not a vegetarian. Paul ate meat. He's not saying, he's not declaring his vegetarianism here. He's saying that he's not going to do it and to put himself in a position where someone else can, can uh, not be offended... That is, uh, you know, oh, I'm offended at that. But to cause them to offend. I'm not going to put myself in a place where a weaker brother can do what he did when I was sitting in the idol's temple there, walk by and see me, and be emboldened to eat himself. And we, back to the faithful saying, you have no right to give up your liberty this liberty of yours. God gave you that liberty, and Paul says you stand fast. Let no man judge you in meat or in drink. So you have no right to give up your liberty. But you have the liberty to give up your rights. You have the freedom to say, I am not going to partake of this, at least not in this situation. You're free to do that for charity's sake. We don't become Pharisees. We have no right to give up our liberty. But at the same time, we understand that knowledge puffeth up. Charity builds up and edifies. So... That's a very short chapter. There's only 13 verses there, but like I said, he's going to go on into chapter 9 and 10 and talk about some other things. But we, uh, we will leave it there.